so there was already a Thank you. 
Matt, this is uh, Rick at the city of Palm Springs. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Rick. All right, so we're going to go. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm just going to have you guys on mute, but I will be listening in. Donatello. Present. Commissioner Hirschbein. Present. Commissioner Song. Present. Vice Chair Maruzzi. Here. Four members present. We have a quorum. Do we have the staff report on the posting of the agenda? Mr. Vice Chair, the agenda was posted on Thursday, December the 5th. This meeting has been noticed and posted in accordance with state law. Mr. Vice Chair, while I have the microphone, because we have only four members of our planning commission due to the recent election uh, of our other members, Three votes will be necessary for an affirmative action of the Planning Commission today. So I just want you to be aware of that, that it will take three votes for an affirmative action based on the quorum of members. Is that always the case? No, only when we have a reduced quorum such as this. Oh, three. Okay, got it. Uh, do the commissioners have any revisions to the agenda? No? With that, I move to accept the agenda. I'll second. Oh, oh you're going to move. All in favor? Aye. All right. Time for public comment. This time has been aside for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on the <coughs> consent calendar, non-public hearing items, and items of general interest within the subject matter of the commission, subject matter jurisdiction of the commission. If you wish to speak on items... Two, I think there's two A, B, C. Those are public hearing items. Uh, the non-public hearing items are under the consent calendar and th three and four. So if you want to speak on any of those items, please come forward at this time. Um, you will have three minutes. And we are prohibited from taking action on items not listed on the posted agenda. Is there anyone here who wants to comment on an item? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Lauren Ostro. I'm here to speak on item 3A, the Living Out Project. Uh, this is a request on our behalf to increase the number of units in the building from 95 to 105. As we were going, and I wanted to explain to you why we've done that and how this came about. As we were going through the process, um, we started, we, we had originally asked the architect designer to create units that were very different from each other so everybody would have a sense of individuality. We created 11 different units. As a result, in the interior of the building, it was very kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And when we started working with D.W. Johnston, the contractor here in Palm Springs, they advised us that the cost of doing that, because uh, there were no efficiencies of plumbing, no efficiencies of electrical, that it was going to be a very expensive project. Uh, so we took that opportunity to relook at doing the interior of the project, uh, not really changing the exterior. Um, and, um, and it was also an opportunity for us not only to increase the number of units because it was great interest in the project, but also to reduce the Homeowners Association dues. Because this has so many amenities, as you can imagine, the Homeowners Association dues were looking like they could be quite large and so with the additional 10 units uh, the cost was spread out over over more units um, we did this by changing the uh, angles of the wings slightly um, and that allowed us to to get more space in the 
in the wings themselves. We reduced the square footage of the core, which had most of the common areas. We removed some of the conference rooms that we figured we didn't need. Uh, and that allowed us to get 105 units. And now we only have two versions. We have a one bedroom and a two bedroom. They're quite large. The one bedroom is a 1,300 square foot. And the two, yeah, they're, they're big. And the, and the two bedroom is between 1,550. And the ones on the end are 1,615 square feet. So uh, we've already been approved, I believe, for the project itself. But uh, because of some city regulation, we had to come back to you for this one specific change. So that's what we're asking for today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Seeing none, we will close the public comment section. Okay, today on the consent calendar, we have the meeting minutes of, let's pull this out, September 11th and September 25th. Any comments or revisions to the minutes? Would someone like to make a motion to accept the calendar? Consent so calendar? moved. Second? I'll second. Thank you. I'll vote. Mr. Chair, just to affirm that voting on the consent calendar includes items 1B, 1C, and 1D in addition to the minutes. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Did you have any comments or thoughts about that? All right. I, I, I'd like to hear a little bit about the Serena project. So you want to pull that? Uh, so, yeah. That's 1B? Yeah, yeah. All right. We will remove 1B. So we will be including 1A, 1C, and 1D in, uh, in addition to the minutes. So let's uh, vote. Being difficult. Oh. Yeah. Let's do it verbally. Well, it's, it's going there. Yeah, but oh. Doug's has not come up. Let's do it verbally, starting with Commissioner Song. Uh, yes. I, I vote that we accept the consent calendar uh, with the uh, Serena part being pulled out. All right, Commissioner Spine? Yes. Don Feld? Yes. And I say yes. All right. Now we're going to move to the public hearing portion of the agenda. Let's see. Oh, that's right. Uh, do we uh, discuss Serena Park now or after the public hearing? Yes, you would discuss it now. And right. Mr. Newell is here to make a presentation to you. Okay, very good. So let's discuss 1B, the annual review of the Serena Park Development Agreement. Chair Marisi and Planning Commissioners, uh, I, in October of last year, the City Council approved amendments to the development agreement um, and uh, established changes to that document, which was originally approved the year prior. Um, some of the changes um, didn't really affect the overall contract, but it did impact the terms and conditions of some of the lending or the finance issues that were the developer was experiencing with the project. So the project was, as I said, amended last year. Um, since that time, there has been, uh, we've conducted our annual review, which is a requirement of the zoning code for development agreements. Um, and you'll note, as uh, outlined in your memorandum, there were four milestones that were um, expected to be um, accomplished within the past year. In November, they were to submit uh, the final development agreement for execution. They were supposed to have financing secured for phase one in March of 19. They were supposed to start their engineering document um, preparation in April of, of this year and finally have an improvement plan approved and a recorded phase map. Uh, of these items, there three of the four have been com uh, completed according to the developer. The fourth item in October of, uh, that was supposed to be completed by October of this year um, the applicant has submitted documents and plan check for the city. Um, and I would note, since this memorandum was written, that the developer has stated they have filed an application for the final 
um, phase or for the, the final map for phase one. So <clears throat> they are getting closer to um, being in adherence to the development agreement and staff will continue to work with them to ensure that the project continues to move forward. And again, we will continually monitor this development agreement for the next year and conduct another. Okay. Sorry, mic turned off. Uh, and we'll conduct another annual review in November of next year um, as required by our code. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Mr. Hirschbein? So what was submitted to plan check? How many units and what's the status of that? So they have filed a final development plan for the first phase and that consists of 17 homes, adjacent perimeter landscape walls, uh, adjacent perimeter walls and landscaping. Um, both of the project entries, so the entry at Whitewater Club Drive as well as the entry at San Rafael and Golden Sands, uh, half of the public park, and finally reconfigure, reconfiguring Desert Sands to a public street. And, so, and does the public park have to be constructed in any kind of sequence with the rest of the development? It's supposed to be constructed in phase one. 100% not half. They should be constructing 100% in phase one. And, and, and so what are they specifically behind in? Uh, for this year, it's the recording of phase one map and the final approval of the improvement plans for phase one. So like I said, they've submitted the final development plan so that will proceed once th that gets through the planning commission. Um, but that's basically gonna be holding that up until we have that final approval. And, and what's the penalty for not complying with the deadlines? There's no penalty um, in terms of specific actions that would occur like a revocation of the development agreement or anything like that. It just comes down to um, have they provided substantial um, compliance. Um, and based on the movement that we've seen from the applicant, we felt that they were close enough to substantial compliance at this time. But there's no consequences for not? The consequences would be um, scheduling this for a public hearing to consider modifying or revoking the agreement. But staff doesn't feel that that was adequate. All right. so, so the consequences are it could be subject it, to revocation? Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other uh, questions of staff or comments? Someone would like to make a motion? I so move the uh, adoption of the staff report and item 1B on the agenda. Second. All right, please vote. This is not working, is it? Mm -hmm. I, mine's not working. I think it is. Mine. It is, but no, no. Oh, yeah. I'll go Let's ahead. do a verbal. Do a, I'll do a, a, a voice call. Uh, Commissioner Donenfeld? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Song? Yes. And Chairman Uzi? Yes. Motion is approved. We can vote, but there's nothing. I know, I, do. Yeah. I, I need to get in this one. Looks like we have some technical issues, but we're going to move forward nonetheless. <laughs> to our first public hearing. Agenda item 2A, request by Stephen on behalf of Reefer Madness LLC for a conditional use permit application to operate a 1,153 square foot cannabis manufacturing and cultivation facility within an existing building. Staff report, please. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Planning Commission. So on June 4, 2019, the city issued a regulatory permit uh, to Mr. Stephen uh, Wiretech on behalf of Reefer Madness uh, for a type six cannabis uh, facility operation. That operation does require a conditional use permit and that's what we have before you this afternoon. So the uh, conditional use permit is for the operation of a cannabis facility that will consist of manufacturing and cultivation. The size of the unit is 1,153 square foot. 
and the area view uh, and vicinity of the um, location is right here on the screen. So that's where uh, the unit is located. It is a building that was constructed in the 90s and it has four units. Unit B that the applicant will contain, uh, that the applicant is proposing, is where uh, the cannabis facility will be taking place. Now, uh, so looking at the first page of the staff report, uh, staff did indicate that the, uh, as one of the issues that the planning department um, identified, that although the location is appropriately zoned, so an M1 that allows a cannabis facility, however, uh, that building and uh, its environment or the surrounding, uh, mostly surrounded by retail storefront uses. So, and as a matter of fact, the adjacent uh, unit to that particular unit is a liquor store. So we saw that as, as a minor issue. However, in looking at the, the plan submitted, in particular, the odor control plan that the applicant has submitted, staff feels that it is adequate to, um, to address all the concerns and issues that we may have. So that's just the background of it. So, now I will go over the, the exhibits that have been submit, submitted. As I mentioned, this is the area view. It is now within the moratorium area. So here is the, um, the, the site plan. So what you see here, this is a unit. This is a unit B. Unit A uh, is a market that's mostly a liquor store and the two other units are, are, are occupied by retail users. I think one of them is by Mobile Boost. The last unit is gonna be occupied by this same applicant. However, that is not in operation yet. That would be a dispensary that does not require a conditional use permit. That unit is currently vacant. So what you have before you that requires a conditional use permit is unit B where the manufacturing and cultivation activities will be taking place. So here are the, the uh, pictures of the site. So the first one is again the, the building, a portion of the building. This is the unit in question. This is one of the retail uh, units in that same uh, center. Here is the a picture of the building itself. Here is an additional picture of the building. These are all the front elevations of the building. Here is the rear elevation of the building uh, where a door will be located. This, this door in particular goes into the building. As I mentioned, the size of this unit is a 1,153 square foot, out of which 242 square foot will be dedicated to manufacturing and cultivation will be 325 square foot. The rest of it will be uh, dedicated to distribution and vegetable areas that serves as, as, a, as an odor barrier. So uh, as we go through the, uh, the exhibits, I will, uh, I will speak more to that. And in fact, the applicant who is a mechanical engineer will be making the presentations and he will be speaking more to you about the design. So here is the floor plan that was submitted. So I talked about the, um, the cultivation area. This is where the cultivation will be located. The cultivation area will be located and the manufacturing and the processing will be taking place here. And it is worth noting that the, the process of manufacturing here will be, will be non-volatile. It will not um, involve any kind of um, uh, chemical or hazardous solvents. The applicant is going to um, talk more about that. He's going to, he's proposed using a mechanical press, very similar to a vice grip that you will see in an autom uh, automotive repair shop. That's what's going to be used for extraction. He's going to be speaking more to that. And as I explained in part of the staff report, as I mentioned earlier, the location is appropriately zoned for this use. An odor control plan was submitted by the applicant, was reviewed by uh, the city's consultant, and um, concluded that it is sufficient to contain odors uh, based on the amount of uh, cultivation activities at the site. 
this is the, uh, the plan of the odor control that was submitted by the applicant. So as you can see, this will involve a box in a box type of construction. What you see here, this is where the activities will be taking place. Both the, there will be new ceiling in a ceiling and walls in a wall designed to contain all the odors or activities to this section. The vestibule areas that will be serving as barriers are here. I'm sorry. And here, he's going to be speaking more to that. However, the odor control uh, consultant looked at it and felt that this is sufficient to contain any type of odors that uh, could be generated in the facility. Staff was able to make the findings um, necessary in support of the CUP. However, as I mentioned earlier, the only issue that uh, the department had is the location of, this, um, of the facility. Although it is appropriately zoned, however, the remainder of activities on this building are retail type that generates a lot of foot traffic. So we conducted um, an environmental assessment of the proposal. It does qualify for a categorical exemption because of the size and because of the activities that will be taking place. Again, it is a type six that does not require any type of hazardous or, or chemicals. It is, and as a result, we were able to um, make a determination that this will be an exempt. It is a public hearing. Notices were sent out to properties around surrounding the area and also to the neighborhood organization in, within uh, half a mile of this location. We did receive uh, several letters. Uh, those were distributed to you this afternoon. Uh, I just want to add that it was 100% in support of the CUP. You have those in front of you. In conclusion, again, because of the proposed installation of a new enclosure, which will serve as a box in a box, we will that will consist of new walls and a new ceiling within the existing unit and the vestibule area that will function as a clean um, air barrier between the manufacturing and cultivation areas. We were able to um, make a recommendation of approval for this project. That will conclude, conclude the staff uh, report. The applicant is in the audience to make additional uh, presentation. And if you have any question, uh, staff is available to answer those. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, because there has been a recent adoption of an ordinance, I'd like to speak to the Planning Commission briefly about the relationship of that ordinance relative to the review of this project. As you're aware, we have recently adopted by City Council on December the 4th new zoning regulations for cannabis uses. As part of the adoption of that ordinance, the City Council specifically specified in the ordinance that applications that were in process, meaning those that have an administrative permit and those that have filed a conditional use permit or administrative minor modification application, may proceed through the process under the existing zoning regulations. And so the application that you have before you today is being considered under the existing zoning regulations that are in place. In your deliberations, you as the Planning Commission are reviewing a conditional use permit, and you are reviewing specifically the findings on pages six and seven of your staff report relative to the proposed use. And so please do not discuss the new regulations that become effective in January relative to this application as they are not applicable to it based on the City Council action. However, you do need to look at the specific findings for a conditional use permit, and you need to evaluate whether or not the proposed application meets those findings. Are there any questions in terms of how we apply that? Oh, no, it's a, a question for staff. Okay, no. thank you. He's staff, too. All right, uh, let's have uh, some questions for staff. Mr. Donenfeld. Edward, uh, in the planning condition number four and five, regarding air filtration and odor prevention. The staff report and the applicant's documentation extensively describes 
both how they're building a box within a box and also what the technology is behind the air filtration and specifically what the air filtration system is going to, to be. Yes. Why wouldn't those specifications be put into the planning conditions? Okay, I can, we will do, I, go ahead and do that then and add those as additional I they, conditions. I think they should be because Correct. It's, yes. it's, a very, it's very important what they're doing and it's very special. So I would. I didn't see them in any other place in the conditions, so I assume they were not there. We'll go ahead and include those in the conditions. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Mr. Ersplein. Is there a sign program for this building? There is no, you know, I, I take that back. I need to go back and review files to make sure. I noticed on the photographs, one of the retail units, I think it's the mobile, has a pretty large sign, I mean, relative to the fascia it's on. And then none of the, do the other ones have signage? Does the market No, have the, so, um, well, the, the units to, to the easterly section, this one right here. Which one? Uh, the, the one that is vacant does have a sign. The but vacant the, one has a sign. Yeah, th What's there is a saying? signage there. Um, that's, those are the only two units with signage. Okay. Yeah, but I, we will go back and review our files for a sign program. Okay. And uh, maybe it's for the applicant, but what would the public see? What, like if I'm standing there and this thing is in operation, what would I see there? At this same unit? Uh, At the proposed unit? Yeah. Most likely, you would not be able to see what goes on on the inside because of the uh, box in the box. That's what you will see if those uh, covers are removed from the window. What would I see if the covers were removed? The, from the, 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 the wall. The so there'll be a, a blank wall up against the correct. glazing? Correct. Yeah, and, and then there will be the office there, right? So there will be... Yes. So looking at the floor plan, just a quick Can second. I was just talking to him. Yeah, so is the, is the right here. I'm gonna pull that up. Yeah. So it's this wall that you will see. And are. In I'll ask the applicant, but in terms of the code or what you're asking us to approve here, is there any uh, uh, requirement or prohibition against the public using that front door there? No, but the applicant is going to be submitting, as I mentioned in the staff report, he'll be required to submit a, uh, an additional application for any type of improvement that will be made to the soft frontage. So at that time, we will evaluate. And but I mean, could he keep that locked? Would that be, or is the public invited in there? I don't understand what that front door would be used for. Well, the front, yeah, it, it could be used by um, either the operators or because yeah, it's going to be, this also includes distribution, so I will imagine that uh, that could be used for that purpose. Okay, okay thank you. Other You're questions welcome. for staff? I, I have a question about this box within a box. And do we have the uh, consultant, the odor consultant, available to speak? Let's see. Matt? Yeah, I'm here on the line. Okay. <laughs> there you go. I'm glad you're here. Uh, the question I have is, Based on the, the public's concern with odor in the past and the nature of this cultivation producing odors, why is it that this technology is different such that you feel confident that it would not produce odors? I wouldn't say the technology is different. I would say that we're, the applicant is employing three different modes of filtration here, or three different levels. So you're starting with the box within a box. So that that initial volume of air is being uh, diluted, uh, free of odors, then discharged into another ancillary space, the odor barrier goes around, and then that air is then further being recirculated and diluted, and that air is also being kept under negative pressure, uh, which goes through a carbon filter prior to uh, discharging to the atmosphere. So the applicant is using multiple carbon filters and multiple stages of filtration as opposed to just relying upon one carbon filter to discharge to the atmosphere. 
And th- how does this differ from others that you have um, examined for the city in terms of this technology? Uh, again, the, the technology doesn't differ. It's just the way that it's employed. And so it, it differs by adding different or adding multiple levels of dilution within the building prior to being discharged in addition to having various uh, pressurization or negative pressure areas uh, to control exfiltration of nuisance odors out of the space. So you have complete confidence that this would contain the odors? Yes, if I were to design a building, I would design it very similar to this. Even though this is a retrofit building? So if you're saying... Correct, you, yes. I see. Yes, uh, the box within a box has been a proven design. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions of our order consultant, Mr. Hirschbein? Well, he's online, so I want to see if there are any other questions for him. Will you stay online, or do we uh, want to let him go? I'll stay on the line. I'll be listening if any of the further okay. questions come up. Okay, very good. Can I so, ask a question of staff? Yes, go ahead. So... In, in terms of criteria we can use to apply uh, to the project in terms of the conditional use permit, are we allowed to look at compatibility with adjacent uses even though this specific use may comply with the zoning? Yes, you may look at compatibility of uses. That's one of the criterion that you have for a conditional use permit. Okay, thank you. So I believe we should open the public hearing. Uh, if you wish to speak, please come forward. You'll have, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. We should have the applicant speak first, which actually apparently is you. So why don't you go first? I can't find my notes. All right. Good afternoon, commissioners and staff. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss my plans. Uh, my name is Stephen Viatic, and I own Reefer Madness. Uh, a few things that make Reefer Madness unique and different from other applicants uh, before the Planning Commission and previous meetings. We are all organic and we do not use any pesticides or chemicals. Um, we are uh, the, oh, thank you. Um, the manufacturing method is a Rawson press, which you see to the right there. Uh, this device is small enough that you can carry it in one arm, as shown to the right. Uh, it is uh, safe, simple, chemical free. Uh, the press is actually in the audience uh, and we can. Uh, look at that after, um, or here it is. Um, we are a vertically integrated microbusiness. Uh, the products produced will be sold in our dispensary to customers needing quality, chemical-free cannabis products. Those products are cannabis flour and ca smokable cannabis wax. Uh, I am a mechanical engineer and experienced cultivator uh, of cannabis under Arizona's caregiver program. Um, if we move on to the next slide here, let's see. Um, so uh, the dispensary, my dispensary is at the, uh, let's see, the, that would be the east side of the property. You see it at the bottom of the page. Um, the manufacturing is going to support the sales in this uh, dispensary. Um, if we look at the adjacent properties, uh, there are, uh, there's a Boost Mobile and there's uh, an Alkaline Water and there's uh, the liquor store and then behind me is AJ's <coughs> Market. Uh, I have met with those owners and discussed my plans, and they all support uh, my business. And they uh, submitted, uh, they signed letters that I submitted, um, and they should be in the record. Um, so, looking at my design from the inside out, uh, it's a box within a box, as we stated, and uh, the box is constructed of um, NPR panels, which are uh, what are used in hospitals, semiconductor clean rooms, and kitchens. Uh, they're waterproof, airtight, and they're a cleanable material made of recycled plastic. Um, just outside the NPR sealed box is an odor-free air barrier. Uh, odor-free air is achieved through carbon filtration. Uh, on the ends of the space are ve vestibules, which function as a triple barrier and airlock, preventing escape of air from the odor-free air barrier. The existing walls that separate the tenant units from one another, they reach all the way to the ceiling with no attic space or drop ceiling, which is ideal in this type of scenario. Uh, if we move on to the next slide here. So there will be nine 12-inch diameter carbon filters attached to 1,700 CFM 
uh, fans. Uh, three function as scrubbed exhaust, while six of them recir recirculate uh, filtered air. Uh, there is a negative pressure gradient through each area. Uh, there are, um, uh, so this, this means that uh, in the event of a crack in the wall or a door left open or something like that, uh, the air is traveling from the outside in, so the odor cannot travel outside. Uh, this system is engineered with redundancy so that if one component fails, another component is already doing the job adequately without help from the failed component. Uh, we call this a fail-safe design. Uh, so for example, there are two uh, filter fan units that exhaust fresh air to the outside uh, in the odor-free air barrier. Uh, the filter fan units are large enough that if one fails, uh, the other is powerful enough on its own to maintain a proper pressure differential by design. If we move on to the next slide here. Uh, so we have uh, exhibit B, so the east side cross-section uh, view from Williams Road. Um, you can see, uh, again, the odor-free air barrier, which is designated in that light blue color. Um, it uh, uh, surrounds the box and even the, the top of the box as well. Um, so the vestibules form a triple, and also on the end, the vestibules, the vestibules form a triple, uh, 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 triple uh, layer of protection. Uh, of containment from the outside world. If we move on to the next slide. Um, so here we have the manufacturing process. So the life cycle of a cannabis plant is 16 weeks. So that's uh, 112 days. Uh, eight weeks are spent in the vegetative state of growing and eight weeks are spent in the flowering state. Uh, most cultivation facilities uh, have large groups of plants uh, that are all the same age. Uh, they harvest the large group of plants all at once, resulting in a burst of odor. Uh, that's not how my facility will operate. Uh, we will have about 56 to 112 plants at any given time in that small space. Um, we will stagger the age of each plant by one day, uh, which will allow us to harvest at most one plant each day. Harvesting one plant produces a very manageable amount of odor, which again is triple contained in our facility behind layers of walls and doors and filtration. Um, so now I'd like to talk about the uh, manufacturing process, the extraction. So the Rawson press, this right here, will sit on top of a toolbox taking up no more than about 12 square feet in area. Uh, material left behind from the process of uh, the processing of the cannabis flower, the, the buds that are sold in the dispensary, uh, that leftover trim will be placed in cheesecloths uh, and squished inside the Rawson press right here and uh, until a waxy honey-like residue excretes, and that's, that's called rosin. Uh, the rosin is collected in airtight jars. We move on to the next slide here. Uh, so here we have the uh, landscape and shading plan. So while most of our improvements focus on the inside of the unit, we recognize that there are some very easy steps that we can take to improve the appearance of the site. Uh, we will add four trees to match the existing Tipuana tree, uh, which is in the corner right. Um, and we can increase the shading coverage, uh, which by the uh, city code and ordinance, we look at 15 years growth, and that will match the city's parking and shading requirements is the objective. Uh, we also plan to, uh, uh, to put down some new gravel in places where uh, there's some bare patches, and we plan on repairing some uh, borders of those planters as well, where uh, some of them are cracked and falling apart. We move on to the next slide. This is our parking lot, or I'm sorry, this is our, uh, our lighting uh, photometric drawing. Um, so I recognize again that there are some things that we can do to parking lot lighting to bring it in line with the city standards, the current standards. Uh, we intend on replacing incandescent bulbs with LED lights along the awning portion of the building. And uh, doing that can uh, reduce the power consumption uh, by about 50%, maybe even better. Uh, we also plan on adding light poles at the front planners. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so we plan on adding light poles at the front planners, uh, or what we might do is uh, uh, I've been researching these uh, solar-powered um, uh, light fixtures that they have a, a solar panel on top with a battery, and the during the during the daytime the solar panel charges the battery, and at night the battery powers the uh, the, the light, and it makes it through the night and they even work uh, when there are some cloudy days. Um, also, lighting will be added to the, to the rear of the building, uh, fixed to the, the building itself. Uh, if we move on to the next slide here, 
so the Bureau of Cannabis Control approved our state license for cultivation and manufacture on September 3rd. That's the email from that confirmation. Uh, we have met all the prerequisites, such as enrollment with the water boards, the California Water Board. Uh, also, we've okayed it with the nearby tribe as required by the water board. Um, we've done everything we can the right way, and I've gone, I've really tried to go above and beyond on my, uh, on, on my design of the odor control plan uh, to address concerns of the city. Um, I've been renting the unit since January, and I selected the M1 zone as the place of my business because it was and, and currently is the zone which allows all types of cannabis business and cultivation and manufacturing, or from cultivation and manufacturing to dispensary and lounge. Um, my proposed manufacturing cultivation is tiny, uh, 242 square feet for the uh, manufacture and 325 square feet for the cultivation. Uh, size does matter. Uh, smaller facilities produce less odor and uh, the odor is easier to contain and control in a small facility. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate, we are all organic. Um, I'd also like to point out that in 2021, uh, the state of California we will begin a comparable to organic program, which is comparable to the national organic program. And uh, we intend to be first in line to apply for that program, as will be all, all organic. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I really hope you approve this project and uh, I'm available for any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're gonna have public comments and then we'll bring you back if there are any questions uh, from the commission. So first, uh, anyone would like to come forward and speak, we'll have three minutes. Is this on? Yes. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, commissioners and staff. Uh, really appreciate the time, allow us to uh, speak on Stephen's behalf. Uh, so we've met Stephen about four years ago. My name is Ken Morehouse. This is my wife, Marcy. Good afternoon. Uh, we, we met Stephen through a friend about four years ago. Um, my wife was sick with multiple autoimmune diseases. Hashimoto, she had thyroid cancer, total thyroidectomy. And one of the challenges we ran into in the medical industry is the thyroid is very... Uh, <clears throat> doctors don't understand the, the technology or the, the way that the thyroid works in the body. So we've, we've gone through a lot of struggles trying to get her back to a quality of life. And one of the things we ran into is all the pills. At one point, she was on 33 pills a day uh, to try to manage her symptomology and everything. Uh, when we met Stephen, one of the, one of the challenges, we, we moved her into the medical marijuana program through Arizona when it was approved, got her card. And the challenge was there was a lot of times that I travel a lot for work. I work in cybersecurity, so I'm on the road a lot. And there's many times that she just wouldn't be able to get into a car and actually drive to the dispensary and pick up. So we needed a caregiver to be able to do this for her, uh, to be able to even just go to the dispensary, pick up the products that she needed to be able to manage her symptoms. Unfortunately, I couldn't be that caregiver because of the nature of work I do, working with the government, working with federal agencies and uh, even state and local government agencies, I'm not qualified to actually get that card without losing my, my ability to do my job. So looking around for caregivers, for me, it was a very high set of standards we needed to manage. Um, I fired multiple doctors because they couldn't give the quality of care that I was looking for for my wife. Um, and when we met Stephen, we've met other people that were fully qualified, capable of doing the job. But Stephen's attention to detail and his professionalism is really what sold us on the fact that this is somebody that I trusted with my wife's medical care. Um, the fact that he was also a cultivator uh, and looking at the product that he was, produ he was capable of producing, it was extreme uh, purity as well as the organic nature of the way he was growing. And that was entirely a lifestyle that we've actually started in, uh, taking on uh, for my wife as far as food, medical care, as much as we can around holistic medicine. So organic and natural is extremely important to the, the, the products that my wife consumes, uh, whether that's food, medication, et cetera. So we're, at this point, she's actually down to two, three pills a day. Uh, <laughs> aside from a couple of supplements that she takes as far as vitamins and so forth. Uh, in addition, she uses medical marijuana exclusively for pain control, anxiety management, sleep, et cetera. Everything and, that the pills were doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Stephen has been instrumental. Um, if it weren't for him, there's been many times that I've been on the road for you know days on end. She's been out in a very quick phone call, and he's, he's always there available. Uh, and even at one point when I was out of work, uh, he was he just never failed to, to produce uh, the need and the support that we needed for my wife. And the biggest thing is the organic of it. Yep. I'm a person that medication and pills, mm -mm. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my, so we have also, there's an email in your, uh, the, 
the records that you have that we've submitted on, on behalf of Stephen as well. Thank you very Any much. Any questions, feel free. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jocelyn Kane, and uh, I represent the Coachella Valley Cannabis Alliance Network. I sent you guys a letter as well in support of this application. Um, I just want to make a few points. Um, as the director uh, instructed, this is a what we call a pipeline applicant, and the council was really clear that uh, these should be uh, considered based on the rules that exist right now, not what's coming. Um, this is a one. Uh, owner business, which is very rare in the cannabis space, uh, and his intention, obviously, uh, aside from this organic uh, and, and tiny uh, cultivation and manufacturing, is also to hire local residents of Palm Springs. He's got two, right, or actually four. He's got a, a lounge, a dispensary, and a tiny cultivation and manufacturing business to support that retail uh, business. And there will be obviously jobs, and jobs are really important to the Valley. And so he is committed to hiring local. Um, we are in a little bit of a, a struggle right now in terms of the cannabis industry. And we're um, facing a tax hike at the state level. Uh, there's lots of ho hoops to jump through, as you know. Um, so uh, we are in total support of this application and hope you consider that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Rick Pantelli. I'm a licensed permitted operator for Northern Lights. You folks approved my permit two years ago. It's one of the largest in the city. This past week, I went and took a look at Stephen's operation on Ramon Road, and uh, the purpose of the meeting was to check out his odor control, see what was going on there. After a careful and extensive review, what I found was is he's gone way above and beyond. Uh, you had asked the gentleman on the phone, what is the difference? And the difference wasn't that he used different things. He just did more of it. Um, one of the plans, his plans are carefully thought out, especially when you think of the size of the building. The design of his structure, which is technical and professional, has been modified so that no odors will be admitted. Secondly, the room within the room concept, you just can't get any better than that. It's uh, upgraded commercial carbon filters are the most important and an added advantage to ensure that there are no odors em emitted. It's worth noting Stephen began his process in February. Uh, his permit was approved in June and now we're here in December, hoping that and knowing that he has done more than he needed to to meet and exceed the requirements and standards by the Planning Commission and the City Council. To assure his operation will be compliant, Stephen has spent close to $10,000 in, in odor control equipment. For the size of his project, to spend that kind of money is overkill. So I want to make sure that people know that he has gone above that. So he can plan. I think the most important thing to know about Stephen is that he will run a professional operation. He will ad adhere to the city's rules and regulations. He will be a good neighbor. He went and spoke to all of his neighbors and got letters of reference from them. So as far as the uh, fact that he is in that area there and we're concerned about what the neighbors think, I actually think he's going to be an addition to that mall. He's going to make it look nicer. The fact that there's a liquor store uh, a few blocks or a few doors down means nothing. If you happen to know that area, it is going to be uh, it's a non-point. Uh, having seen this through the review, I believe that um, I, I would ask that the commission go ahead and approve his C CUP. I have over 13 years of doing this here in the city of Palm Springs. And I take this stuff very seriously, and that's why I put on my nice clothes to come down here <laughs> and see you today and miss the hearings on TV. I'll see you later. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience who would like to speak? Hmm. All right, seeing none, you do have a two-minute rebuttal if you want. You want to use those two minutes? So since I have two minutes, um, I just want to address a couple things that I saw come up during the discussion. Um, one of those was a question about a sign program. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no sign program. Uh, however, once we get the business up and operating, and we don't, uh, we don't need uh, a sign on the, on the business for a manufacturing and cultivation. Um, however, um, the dispensary 
uh, eventually we, we would like to have a sign on that dispensary. So we don't need the sign on the dispensary um, to begin operations, but in the future, we do hope to work with those, uh, those neighboring tenants and help out with a, a sign program so everybody has a sign. Um, the other uh, thing that I uh, jotted down, um, uh, we asked uh, w what, will, what will we see at the front of that unit? And uh, there'll be artwork displayed three feet behind the glass. So we wanted to leave the glass uh, so that it matches uh, the other uh, tenant units. And uh, we're gonna construct a wall that's approximately three feet behind that. There are certain building codes that we'll have to adhere to, and that'll be a part of our building plans. Uh, but we want, it, we want it basically be where you can see just a, a wall and a hallway, and there'll be some decorative modern artwork on the wall. Uh, maybe we'll have a pattern on the wall as well. Um, and that's uh, shown in one of, the, um, um, one of the pages of your packet. I think it's page seven or page eight. It briefly came up uh, on, the, uh, um, on Edward's slides. It's the, uh, I think it's labeled the elevations. It's the one where you can see the, the building and all the colors, the existing colors. Um, let's see here, the other thing I jotted down is, oh, what, what, what would that part of the, um, uh, what would that front area be used for? Why do we need doors there? Uh, we intend on going in and out through the back as that's a larger vestibule. However, the front will be used uh, for an emergency or if we're doing maintenance to that uh, first vestibule, then we can, we can use the second one. Um, that's it, but I'm available for questions if you have. Why don't you remain there in case we have questions from the commission of the applicant? Yes, Mr. Hirschbein. Uh, you, you addressed the walls of the box in the box. What about the ceiling? The ceiling will be constructed of the same material, so it's going to be metal uh, studs per the current building standards, the studs on the walls and also the ceiling, and those studs will be completely wrapped in the NPR panels, which is uh, similar to um, uh, reinforced fiber polyester panels. Uh, and does the are, ceiling get penetrated for HVAC or lighting or electrical or anything? It will be penetrated for the, uh, the carbon air filters, and there may be some additional uh, cooling. There might be a, a split unit AC to control the temperature of that environment uh, in addition to uh, the environment just outside. Okay. At one time we were told that um, uh, a filter, and I might not get this wording right, but a precipitate, precipitate filter, one that, uh, you know, water drips down over the air, is more effective than carbon. Have you, did you look at that type of filtration process? Um, I'm not sure the process you're describing, but I am familiar with other processes. There are, uh, there are processes where they spray things in the air, like uh, cuprous iodine, and what that does is it uh, attaches to the uh, odor, molecule, odor molecule and effectively neutralizes it. Reason I didn't want to get into cuprous iodine is uh, it does put iodine in the, in the air and uh, I did my own calculation and if, um, if there was a lot of it and people were walking around with their mouths open taking deep breaths, you would get a good do dose of iodine that could be potentially similar to uh, what uh, you would be given uh, as an iodine pill to protect your thyroid in the event of a nuclear disaster. And that's not something that you want to give yourself all the time in my This my was, uh, uh, I, I think they use it in restaurants where, where water is, is dripped across the air that's blowing sideways. I'm, I'm not familiar with one that uses water. Maybe our odor consultant, if he's still on the line, he might be familiar. Okay, all right, thank you. Ms. Song? Um, so on, on this particular application, you're not going to have any need to put any signage program? Correct. No need for a sign. Okay. Um, and what you mentioned is um, in, in one of your building sections, you actually show the negative pressure mechanism suction exhaust uh, a device and actually in the vestibule. So would I, if I'm parking on the uh, parking lot, would I be able to see the mechanical unit um, off of the storefront? You, you will not uh, because... Uh, is that you, behind the vestibule or is that in there, a soffit? Most of them are behind the vestibule, but there is one in the vestibule to ensure that that air is constantly filtered so it's clean in case the door is opened. Uh, however, it will be pretty much blocked by 
uh, a wall. Uh, so the, the front of that uh, tenant unit, it's mostly glass. The door is glass, and then there's some windows next to the glass up until the corner of the building. Then there's approximately, uh, I want to say, about six feet of uh, solid uh, stucco. Right. Uh, so the position of the filter is going to be behind that, uh, with the objective being that it's not visible through the glass. All we'll see is a wall or artwork on the wall. Okay. And... Um and, and once again, the reason why you didn't want to put the artwork directly on the back side of the glass is because you wanted to have a continuous sort of solemn look right. of the storefront. So artwork looks better, in my opinion, when it's, it's on a flat white background. And then you can also position some lights aimed on the artwork uh, yeah, so that at nighttime it looks Yeah, there's pros cool. and cons because by, by putting this artwork behind and if you don't keep the place clean, then it becomes a exposed storage space of commercial needs in which it becomes an eyesore. Um, and then the other idea is that if you do put it on the storefront glass, then there is no ambiguity of what's happening behind the storefront. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. If it's the direction of the commission to uh, have artwork on the glass as opposed to the wall, I'm fine with that. My, my whole sense of where the where the staff was coming from is the actual location that it seems to be a retail corner. And you're introducing this use, which is very well in the zoning um, plan. But the idea of that is if this business helps the corner and helps your business as a micro business as well, then why not make that into a discrete storefront, you know, rather than an abandoned uh, void space? Um, uh, that, that's what I'm um, leaning to is that it's discreet, but then there is really no wait for anybody to know what's going on behind the storefront. Certainly. Yeah. So as a condition, we could, uh, instead of having the glass, we could remove that glass and it would just be stucco, like the six inch, or I'm sorry, six foot uh, section of wall that's existing next to the liquor store. So the other question is, um, I, I know that in the future applications, you're going to be coming up with a, a retail part of this. The retail is already approved. Uh, I submitted building plans, uh, I forget the exact date, approximately uh, two months ago, and those building plans were approved. Oh, so uh, the, the gray ago. and yellow paint stripes were all approved as an architectural package? So the, that, that's the existing uh, color of the building. I'm not proposing any changes to the, um, to the painting of the building. Sorry, are you saying that that corner the visible corner that it's also part of your business has already been approved design-wise and project-wise? The, the dispensary and lounge, um, they don't require a conditional use permit. Oh. So all the applicant is doing there is a tenant improvement in that space. Now, under the new regulations, they would be required to go through architectural review right. regardless. Right. Um, but those don't take effect yet. Right. I, I'm just surprised because it's a pretty visible corner in which, you know, paint selection-wise has not been uh, reviewed through staff. Yeah. If they are keeping the existing paint that's on the building, then no approval would be necessary. If they do a building repaint... Uh, it could either be approved at a staff level or could be forwarded to the Architectural Advisory Committee. Okay, but Flynn, even that existing scheme has not been reviewed. I, the it's, previous applicant has never brought it as... Yeah, it's been in place for quite some time. Correct. So I couldn't tell you when it was done um, or if there was any type of notice of violation or anything like that associated with it. We don't have a record of that, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but uh, again, if we could confine our comments to sure. the tenant space at hand. Sure. Um, I, as far as the, uh, the site lighting goes, you have the typical sort of stadium parking shoebox um, light fixture and not something that, you know, it's a small corner neighborhood um, commercial area, and so are you open to bringing more, a more stylistic um, uh, light pole design to this? Sure, yeah, we can. I have seen um, lights that go on the palm trees, and we have, I think, four or five palm trees uh, in the front of that site, and I've seen um, uh, downtown where there are these light fixtures that kind of aim up at the top of the palm tree to light the it canopy. up and make it attractive at night. I would be open to that sort of thing. Uh, it would have to 
meet all the building requirements. And I, I, I believe light fixtures are supposed to be, or at least light fixtures of a certain caliber are supposed to be off. full cut off. Yeah. And I am right underneath the, uh, uh, the airport's landing path. So right. it's important that we don't shine too much to the sky because that might affect their, their landing. And you're not proposing any more um, additional lighting off of the um, on, um, underside of the roof overhang whatsoever to your uh, manufacturing, to this application? Uh, sort of. So the, the awning, that overhang that we're referring to, um, <clears throat> there are existing fixtures in there uh, that are um, they're, they're either halogen or they're incandescent, which are not as good as LED. Right. Uh, so we're proposing to just go through and replace all those bulbs with a LED uh, equivalent. Or consistent will, lighting. Consistent lighting and energy savings as well, being green. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? All right. Why don't you just um, sit there and we'll just uh, have some discussion. Mr. Donenfeld. I uh, have to compliment the applicant on the thoroughness with respect to the technology. I wish, I know you've got a small space, so it's probably economical, more economical to do it in a small cultivation area <laughs> than one of these larger areas. But I, I like the box within the box, of course, and I think you've gone the extra mile to have redundancy in the, the air filter systems. Um, it's an unusual place to have a cultivation uh, operation, but I think you've done it well, and I would support this application. Uh, with respect to the art, I really have to defer to our aesthetics uh, expert here, but sometimes <laughs> when you do it on the glass, it over time gets, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I thought I had it off, I'm sorry. Uh, sometimes it, 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 it deteriorates more quickly because of the, the, the sun and the elements out here. I sort of like the idea of having it set back, particularly if you can light it in a sort of interesting way. But thats I don't really care one way or the other. It's sort of up to you. And if Ms. Song feels strongly about that, I would support her in that. But I do support your project. Mr. Hirschbein. I, I too applaud the level of detail you've applied to this. Unfortunately, um, from an adjacency standpoint, I, I think it really uh, uh, does a detriment to the uh, retail or commercial nature of the site and uh, not because of the uh, issues around um, level six or, or odor control because I think you might have nailed it. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert at that, but it seems like you may have. Uh, but in terms of kind of the urban planning point where you're trying to activate or keep activated what's turned into a small commercial build, uh, small retail building. Uh, it, I don't know what percentage this is of the whole building, maybe 20% or 25% of the building. You're going to kill that portion of the building as an opportunity to further activate that building, and therefore I would oppose it. Bruce Song? Um, I... Um, I applaud the efforts that uh, you have put together. Um, I, we, we, it's not your first time that you've been in front of this commission. Um, and um, by having your mechanical engineer background, I think you heard our previous comments and you were able to implement them. Um, I agree with Michael, but I think the application is thorough. And um, um, I, think that the um, storefront renovations uh, ideas should go in front of AAC um, as their opinion. Um, but other than that, I, I would support this project. Um, it's a very small retail space on a very busy street. The building, I'm sorry, excuse me, commercial building. Or what industrial building that has commercial uh, aspects. Um, and it's the space that they're uh, discussing is very, very small. It's in the elbow or the uh, middle of the L. And I've I drove by the other day and I w parked in the facility. And it, especially with the artwork, it won't be detrimental to the overall feeling of that um, of that building. And I really do think that they went out of their way 
knowing the kinds of questions we would have and the concerns that the community has to put together a project that is about as good as I can imagine uh, a retrofit could be, and our odor consultant apparently agrees. So I would support the project. I don't know if I agree with the AAC uh, having to review this, though. I think he's been through the mill on this one, and it's a very small space. <laughs> I, I, will, I won't back down on that, both on the lighting fixture uh, or lighting design, uh, site design, and uh, storefront. I, I think we, we do need that uh, committee to review it. So, uh, Flynn, what would be the process if it went back to AEC and how long would that take? Uh, unfortunately, our January 6th agenda is already full, so the soonest we could do it is at the second meeting in January. What we might offer as an alternative, rather than sending it to the full AAC, is to send it to an AAC subcommittee. That way we could get the applicant through the process sooner, but it at least has the input of our AAC members. I accept that amendment. <laughs> and would, if uh, we approve that with this um, condition, would they still be able to uh, immediately start working um, on the interior while yeah. they're waiting for the AAC? Absolutely. Uh, because the AAC will only be reviewing the exterior of the project, they could do interior work uh, ahead of AAC approval. Okay, very good. Any other discussion? Would somebody call a motion? Make a motion? I'll make a motion to accept uh, to approve this project with the conditions of a subcommittee of AAC to review the storefront and the site lighting design. I'll second the motion. And just, Mr. Chair, there was also a comment made earlier by Commissioner Donenfeld Correct. relative to uh, planning condition Thank you four for and five, <laughs> and referencing the specifications yes. of the odor control system. Yes, that's part of. I, so, is that okay with the motion maker? Yes, I, I'll. Accept that. So I will second the motion with that addition, con additional condition. Any further discussion? All right, we'll go ahead and vote, please. You vote. We can't vote. We're, we're, aren't you calling the roll? Commissioner Donenfeld? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? No. Commissioner Song? Yes. And Mr. Maruzzi. Yes. Congratulations. All right. Let's move on to our second public hearing. Item 2B, AT&T Mobility for a conditional use permit and variance to construct and operate a wireless telecommunication facility consisting of a 100-foot tall monopole and related equipment on a portion of a 40-acre site. Staff report, please. Chair Maruzzi and Planning Commissioners, this application before you is a request for a conditional use permit to construct and operate a wireless communication facility. Uh, in our code, section 94.02, the conditional use permit section, a, such facilities can be permitted by conditional use permit when approved by Planning Commission and Council. So they're requesting a 100 foot high monopole uh, with antennas at the top um, of the structure and proposing equipment related to that structure at the ground uh, as ground mounted um, installation as well. They are also requesting an invariance application to exceed the structure height permitted within the M2 zone. The um, permitted height is 65 feet and as I mentioned 100 feet is proposed. So the site is a 40 acre property and of course this facility will only occupy a small portion of that at the southwest corner of the site. The site is located on 19th Avenue, the north side of 19th Avenue where Rupert Street terminates um, into 19th Avenue. And uh, as I said, the facility will be at the southwest corner of the property. I've highlighted in red on the screen here where that is located. Uh, it'll be roughly 75 feet off of the property line and 25 feet back from the existing fence um, where the facility's lease area will start. Uh, they will have access from the existing entry into the site located off of 
uh, where it would be Rupert Street. Um, and so that's how they would service the facility for regular maintenance. Uh, the lease area is about 800 square feet, and that consists of the walled or fenced area uh, as well. And within that area, they have proposed the monopole structure, a generator, and um, other equipment. This is an elevation of the facility. As, uh, as I stated, it is a 100-foot tall uh, structure. And you see at the bottom, at the base of it, there is the equipment proposed uh, for the facility that would be surrounded by, a, they're proposing a chain link fence with some um, landscape around it. Again, another elevation on the south and west uh, views of the structure and related equipment. So the applicant has provided visual simulations, which you see here on the screen of the proposed facility. On the top left, you see an overall aerial view standing, uh, looks like it's to the east of the proposed facility looking towards the west. Uh, you can see existing condition at the bottom left on the screen and then a larger picture of showing what the facility would look like in the current conditions. Uh, you can see on the photo here in view one, there is an existing peaker plant just directly west of the facility. Um, and the site, uh, you can see another view of it here, standing on 19th Avenue, looking towards the northwest. <coughs> and the site also has existing windmills located uh, within the property, and so they are actually northeast of this facility, and you see them here in this visual simulation. So staff has prepared uh, findings in support of these applications. Um, both for the conditional use permit as well as the variance application, noting that the um, project complies with the necessary findings and criteria for approval. Um, there are recommended conditions in your resolution for this project. Uh, we recommend that the project have, that the, the, fence area, the fence surrounding the lease area be changed to a block wall material. Um, and uh, you'll see that at the dais today, you received a letter from the property owner uh, opposing that condition. So that is something that you'll want to consider um, as a part of your uh, review of this project. And then I'll also note that there was an error on planning condition PLN number eight. That condition states that the height of the structure is limited to 48 feet, but that is not the case. Uh, in this project, it is 100 feet um, based on uh, the proposed project. So that would be a correction to planning condition number PLN number eight. Um, and so that concludes my presentation. This is a public hearing and the project that we did provide notice to property owners within 500 feet of the site as well as publish it within the Desert Sun. Um, so uh, um, that concludes my presentation and I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there questions for staff? Mr. Hirschbein. Uh, what's the rationale for requesting the block wall? There's this, uh, in the development standards uh, of the M2 zone, there's um, a, crit or a requirement that all walls shall be constructed of solid masonry materials. So for that, for that reason, we recommend that this be a wall as opposed to a chain link fence. So, so our development standards uh, prohibit uh, chain link fences in all M2 zones? It's not that they're necessarily prohibited, but that is what is a suggested um, design of structures. Okay. But other than that, is there a specific rationale at this site having to do with the site itself? Or is it just compliance with the development standards? Oh, it's compliance with the development standards, and there is, um, in the adjacent area, there is other walls. Uh, for instance, the Peaker plant has a wall around it, so. Has no chain link, the Peaker plant has no chain link fencing? I think they might have some, but I think t towards the street facing view, it has some block walls. Okay. Other questions for staff? Ms. Song? Um, hi, David. Uh, 
so the plan shows uh, a circumference of of uh, shrubs, proposed shrubs, um, and uh, it asks for. It says reference to landscape plan. And did I miss the landscape plan? It's the uh, last sheet before the photo simulation, so it's sheet L1. It's a Texas Ranger, five gallon. Five gallon Texas Ranger. <coughs> um, okay. That's all, right? There's no other Correct. planting material, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dunfeld. With respect to, I can't remember because this is the first time we've had um, one of these transmission facilities before us. Have we required where it was a monopole situation or in other situations that the equipment on the ground be surrounded by a brick wall as opposed to a, a more industrial-like fence? Has that typically been our requirement? There has been uh, applications that was a uh, a revision to a project, yes. Do you know the, the applicant's representative talks about security issues which sound like, you know, walls that you can't see through do invite people to do things behind them. And this is not particularly in an area where people visit. I mean, it's very remote. I'd love to see all of our monopoles right there. But we can't do that, <laughs> obviously. But have you given any thought, or have you talked to the police department about how they would feel about a fence versus a wall? The police department would probably recommend that it would be a transparent structure so that they could see through it. Yeah, I would uh, think so. I mean, I would normally look, think about the aesthetics, and I'm sure that's what you're thinking about. But out there, there's nothing. Aesthetics don't really apply anywhere. It's 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 totally industrial and and very very uh, unpopulated. Yeah. So I, I would think perhaps we would go with what the applicant wants, uh, with, uh, with something that you could see through. I think it's funny, as deserted as that area looks, I, I have a feeling that a lot of things go on under those uh, <laughs> windmills. And I think it's a very dangerous area. So it might be better uh, for security purposes that we allow the fence. Applicant can answer this, but the the simulation view three shows uh, I don't know what road that is, but it shows fencing and it looks like concertina wire on top. Is that existing or is that part of the simulation? There is an existing fence along the front of the property with concertina so. wire. I think it is. Yes. Okay. Thanks. I have a question for Sal. Uh, the applicant. Uh, in their letter, believes that landscaping is unrealistic. And they say com conventional commercial site landscaping does not survive the harsh winds and weather conditions that define this location. There's no irrigation available and no windshields to hope this, the landscaping survives artificially. That's a windy, windy area, hence the windmill. I, I just don't understand why we would require them to put in landscaping, which would invariably blow away or die, um, yes, Flynn? We agree that there are difficulties in establishing landscaping in that area, only in rare situations, as you'll see with the fast food restaurants around the freeway interchange, has there been any success with maintaining landscaping. Other facilities in the area, uh, again, it's, it poses some challenges, especially when you're further away on the plain, more or less, that you're more susceptible to the wind. Um, while we would typically require landscaping if this facil facility were located closer into town, uh, there might be some merit to considering uh, not requiring the landscaping for this particular facility based on its individual site conditions. Any other questions for staff? All right, I'd like to hear from the applicant. Is the applicant here? Please come forward. You have 10 minutes to present and uh, two minutes for rebuttal, if there is need for that. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Doheny. I uh, 
am employed with SmartLink, and we are the applicant uh, working on behalf of AT&T Wireless. And um, I just want to um, kind of just follow up on what's uh, already been discussed and um, with the, regards to the landscaping request and the CMU enclosure. Uh, as far as the landscaping, um, we did submit a landscape plans that uh, as part of our, our package that uh, we submitted as part of the uh, CUP review <clears throat> because it's, part, it's required as part of the, part of the package. But uh, since then, we've heard input that the environmental conditions in the area, the high winds, uh, make it difficult for uh, the, you know, the vegetation that is, is provided to, will not survive. So that, uh, you know, we'll just follow the input of the, the council and the uh, commission on that. And then um, also with regards to the CMU enclosure, again, it, uh, our preference would be to go with the uh, chain link fence uh, for the security reasons and also not only um, it has occurred in the past where people will uh, access those areas to get, get a hold of copper or uh, other materials that they value or um, homeless sometimes will take advantage of the shelter within the CMU enclosure because it provides some kind of a, you know, uh, secure area for them to, to settle. Uh, so that's also an issue. Our preference would be to go with the chain link fence. It's visible from the road. Um, so that would, uh, you know, that would be my only input at this point. All right. Thank you. Um, now we should open up uh, this to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I guess you don't uh, need a rebuttal. And um, we could have some questions of the applicant. Ms. Song. Um, I, I hear your issues about the chain link fence. Um, is there any way that you could have at least one or two block as a curve and then start the chain link fence? Because the look over there is that, you know, when there's like paper or plastic bags with chain link fence, it gets caught and then it just becomes a, a, a dirty look. Um, and so if we had at least uh, some sort of curb and then the chain link fence, then you can have the stability of a, a sort of like a exposed footing and then be able to see through still. And, you know, within 12 inches, I don't think anybody could hide um, in that curb. Mm -hmm. um, it, just one of the thoughts to make it look more stable um, than just a, a chain link fence. Um, another option would be, other than a chain link fence, would be to use a, a wrought iron fence, um, yeah. which would be more stable. Yeah, Again, more it stable wouldn't looking. prevent the plastic bags yeah. build up. Uh, yeah. But we do, uh, I think as part of the conditions, there's a maintenance requirement that, you know, if visibility or uh, aesthetics become an issue, that they're required to, to maintain that and keep it uh, relatively, you know, a clean area. So the 60-some uh, feet that we have in our ordinance, is, is that old school now? It, it, is it, are the towers now mm -hmm. requiring 100 feet and that far apart from, um, in order to cover that zone? Is, is that where the technology is going? No, 65 feet is, uh, is reasonable um, because of the location of this, this facility and um, of the significant gap that, it, that currently AT&T is trying to serve. Um, 100 feet does, does provide a, a much you know, better coverage um, than a 65-foot facility would, would provide. And, and the, my last question is, uh, I, I'm sure you looked at uh, the fall zone of the air uh, mills, windmill, sorry, uh, and it doesn't fall into that cup, fall zone. No, I don't believe so. I'm... Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Well... Alrighty, it looks like we could uh, entertain a motion. I, I made a motion. I'm, I oh, did you? That button. I didn't see that. <laughs> did uh, someone second yet? I'll second. All right. Any discussion? All right. Did we resolve how we want to? Did you like? I the think the applicant is proposing a, a tubular metal fence, not a wrought iron, because that's old school. But and I and I think that's a a, a good in between. 
my, uh, my motion is going to be to omit the landscaping and to, and to do a chain link fence. There's just miles of chain link fence out there. I don't know what a tubular fence, I mean, then you got to get into like what color is it, how big are the pickets, how far apart are they, does it go to AAC? I don't want to do that. I, I, my motion is going to be um, chain link and no landscaping and approve. And it doesn't sound like you want to entertain anything different. That's going to be my motion. If you want to make a different motion. Mr. Donneveld, uh, did you second the existing? I, I did second Mr. Hirschbein's uh, motion. All right. Well, if there's no more discussion, then let's call the vote. Commissioner Donnenfeld? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Song? No. And Vice Chair Mouzi? Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. All righty. Uh, third public hearing. Let's see. Oh, wait a second here. It looks like, uh, Flynn, would you like to? Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if you would, we would like to continue the orchid tree item to the meeting of January 22nd. Uh, we expect that at that date we will have the new site plan for the orchid tree to be considered, and so we'll look at those applications together. Uh, so if I could have a motion and a vote by the Planning Commission to continue the item to a date certain. Can I ask a question about it? Please. What, what, what did council, has council taken any recent action on that? Uh, yes, they did. In uh, looking at the extension of the entitlements, they have put a time frame in place for the applicant to perform, including milestones. One of those is approval of a new site plan, and by having that come forward to you all in January, they will meet that milestone. So, so we're, not gonna, we're not being asked to uh, vote on the extent, time extension, we're just being asked to approve a site plan, or it, will be it, asked. Yes, potentially that will be the action on the 22nd. Okay, thanks. Someone would like to make a motion? All righty, and second. Motion to comply with staff's request. And it's seconded by Commissioner Song. I second that. Commissioner well, Donenfeld? A... Yes. Commissioner yes. Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Song? Yes. And Vice Chairman Wuzi? Yes. Motion to continue passes. All right, we're closing our public hearing. Moving on to new, oh, unfinished business, actually. Uh, uh, do we have a staff report on this? Yes, we do, Chair. Thank you. So this is an application by CORE Palm Springs doing, uh, doing business as living out for a minor amendment to an approved final development district to increase the unit count from 95 to 105 units with no changes to the approved site plan. So the Planning Commission reviewed this, I'm sorry, approved this project on November 13th of this year, 2019. Uh, for the final development plan, which means that they need to submit building permits uh, and uh, within six months from that date. Uh, and they are well underway of, of complying with that uh, regulation. So in the meantime, they have, as you heard the applicant uh, speak earlier, uh, is looking to reconfigure the interior of the site to include uh, an additional 10 units, uh, which will change some of the unit counts. And I'll go over that uh, here in just a minute. So what they're requesting is to go from 95 to 105. So the approved PD, the final PD, had 61 one bedrooms and 34 two bedrooms. The amendment will make uh, will increase the one bedrooms to 69 and the two bedrooms to 36. In terms of how that affects parking, the approved PD had one bedroom units at 77 spaces, the two at 51, guests at 24, and a total of 152 units, I'm sorry, spaces. The amendment increases the number of parking spaces to 168, and within uh, the reconfiguration of the site plan uh, under, under the building uh, and reworking some of the, the uh, the double loaded spaces, uh, they can meet this requirement. Uh, this does not change, uh, as you know, there's a retail component to the, the development plan uh, and that uh, will remain the same uh, and they meet the requirement for the retail portion of the project. Uh, so this is on the slide, a site plan showing what the Planning Commission had approved last month. As, you, as I mentioned, most of the changes are internal and will not change the intent of the site plan uh, and it meets the, the 
the, the zoning code requirement of how you can amend a PD. So section 940300G states that a modification of a planned development district may be modified by submitting a request and uh, the Planning Commission can approve that minor modification. And in the staff report, there's a series of requirements that this staff has determined that the applicant has met. So in your staff report, there uh, is floor plans that show the new reconfigured, uh, how the units will uh, be worked out on the first, second, and third floor. It also shows the parking underneath the building, uh, has some roof plans, and then a reconfiguration of the first floor area where the common areas where uh, you enter the building on the second floor where uh, activities such as game rooms, salons, uh, and uh, other office spaces, and then obviously in the third floor, the fitness center and theater. So the applicant did submit uh, two letters justifying the request, uh, and there is a brief explanation as to um, why they're requesting this, and once again, the applicant made his comments earlier uh, in the meeting. So to conclude, the Staff is recommending approval of the minor amendment to the PD to increase the unit count to 95, I'm sorry, from 95 to 105. There is no requirement that notice be given. Because it is a minor amendment, does not need to go to the, the city council for approval. It's not, it just comes before the planning commission. There is a resolution for your consideration. Uh, and then I included the resolution that was approved by the planning commission back in November uh, for uh, your review. So that concludes my report, and as you know, the applicant is here if you so choose to have them come up and discuss the project again. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair. Questions for staff? Mr. Hirschbein. Applicant, but is the sheet that shows the enlarged core areas of the building, is it mislabeled because it says second floor, second floor? Yes, that's the, the very far one to the right should say third floor. So miss, okay, third floor. And uh, maybe this is for uh, applicant also, but uh, he mentioned in the public comments that um, some of the public areas, common areas, would be reduced. Do you, do you know what those are? Do we have a uh, 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 comparison? I would have to defer to the applicant okay. if you so choose to bring Thanks. him up. Other questions of staff? Would you like to hear from the applicant, Mr. Hirschbein? Uh, would you please come up? I, um, so as it relates to the what we changed in the common areas, we did get rid of the yoga room, and then this is Jerry Sherman. So that's on the first floor. No, what? yoga, yoga what? was on the third. So, so what? What did you? Let's start. Floor what by you floor. see here is what's been approved already. This is the revised. This is the revision. I'm sorry. Say that again. What you're being shown is the revision. Correct. So on the first floor, were there any changes to the? Size of the dining area or lounge? Yeah, the, the dining room uh, was reduced. By how much? Three hundred square feet. The, the, the dining room was not, we determined that it was not feasible at the size that we had originally planned. Okay, not okay. and then usage. what changed on the second floor? Uh, second floor, we got rid of a couple of offices, two or three offices that we had up there. They were going to be for, for operation functions. And but no stuff. common area? No. Okay, and on the third floor? Third floor was the... Uh, we had a deck. We had an outdoor deck. Uh, outdoor deck, which we enclosed. Um, if you look on the, uh, which is the third floor, which is the far uh, right yeah. diagram. Yeah. Uh, if you look in the lower left, that unit that's there, that used to be uh, an outdoor deck. At next to the fitness center? Uh, no, next to the theater. Next to the theater, okay. Yeah, that used to be an outdoor deck in there. Okay. How, how, was it big? Yeah, it was quite large, yeah. Well, that's sad, but okay. All right, thank you. Other questions for the applicant? Ms. Dunfeld? Uh, how, is the, how are the changes affecting the square feet of the units? The units are smaller 
uh, as I said, there are 1,200 for a one bedroom, uh, 1,300 for a one bedroom. And what bedroom. were they before for the one? They were cl closer to 14. We had a den. We had a one bedroom and a den. And yeah. we reconfigured to make them, we, we wanted to give the same feeling of size, so we made them kind of shotgun, but very open. Whereas the other, the first units were kind of like labyrinth. And so they didn't have that feeling of, of size. And the second bedrooms have second been Second bedrooms are between 1550 yeah, and 1650. And how much reduction in those? Uh, th those actually weren't. They weren't much. reduced. Not much, just a few square feet, but not much. The width of the units actually on the one bedrooms <coughs> got a little narrower, and that's how we were able to get more units. And it, with respect to externals, nothing's changed. No. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant? Ms. Song? So in the art articulation of where the two wings meet and then you have these common areas, uh, before you had an um, outdoor terrace on the third floor, and so it, it, it didn't it give uh, like articulation on the building massing, and then now it's enclosed, or yeah, could you explain how did that not change the aesthetics of the... Yeah, the, the, the deck was actually on the west side of the building. It wasn't uh, facing the street. And, okay. Uh, and I believe most people actually never even noticed that it was there. But uh, so all we did is we, we mimicked the same facade as the units and put that, the new units in there too. One no, I, I meant more on that, on, on the corner... It, at the intersection of the two wings. It did, that didn't change. The deck was outside of that. Okay. That corner. Okay. I understand. Any other questions? Thank you very much for coming up. Uh, let's open this for discussion. Mr. Song? Uh, I... I believe the, uh, the the changes are not drastic to what the application was originally proposed. So I, I believe that uh, I'm ready to make a motion to accept what is being uh, submitted here. Commissioner Donnefeld? I would support the, the changes. I agree with Commissioner Song. They're, they're real, relatively minor, and that's what an amendment to a approved PD is all about. Any other discussion? Would someone like to make a motion? I make a motion to accept the application uh, and the amendment submitted. Someone second, please. I guess your button's not working, but yeah, oh, seconded by Michael, Mr. Donnefeld. Did you second? It didn't appear, oh, so I'll, it must be I'll second. Uh, let's call the vote. Commissioner Donnefeld? Yes. yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Song? Yes. And Vice Chair Maruzzi? Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. Well, uh, it's come to our attention that the item 1B on the consent calendar, I, I want to just make sure I um, understand this. When I asked for public comment uh, at the beginning on non, uh, uh, let's see, public hearing items, was it clear that I was including 1B before it was pulled by Mr. Hirschbein? I don't know if you announced it, but it is listed in our agenda that members of the public who would like to comment on items 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 3A, 4A, and 5A are directed to comment under the public comment portion of the agenda. So it is in the agenda itself. So when Mr. Hirschbein, um, when we pulled this and we spoke about it later, it was not necessary to reopen the ability for comments from the public? No, it would have been done at the very beginning of the meeting. All right, so unfortunately you missed that opportunity, sir. Uh, unless he, well, the, the pleasure of the commission to uh, hear him speak, and we, I don't think we're reopening the item. Okay, would, would you like to still speak? Honestly, Come forward. One minute, I promise. Already. Um, and I apologize if I misunderstood, I was sitting here, and I thought that it was taken out, and then I didn't hear That's the opportunity to jump understandable. In, so I apologize. Um, my name is Robert O'Connell. I'm a, a tenant and owner in Palm Springs Country Club, which actually, if you look at that picture, you can see the development really clearly. It's kind of great. Um, I just had a couple of things to mention. Just two were quick observations. Um, after reading uh, all of the notes, it mentions in 
Ordinance 1931, page six, there's a breakdown that it, uh, it only adds up to 366 units. That was just a question I have for you, like a, a, for further information. Um, it, then it breaks down to 92 plus 214 plus 60, and that equals 366, not 386. So I was just curious how many units there will be in the future. Um, and then I guess I would just respectfully ask the developers, um, the current occupants that are there are what's called Palm Springs Country Club. And the paperwork kind of talks about how the area is deserted and a blight and this new development's going to be uh, great and they refer to it as kind of just as blighted area. We've been a little bit of like a, 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 an island surrounded by a moat that once was a country club and is now vacant land. But the moat is still there. And it's my understanding that originally, because it is a um, William Cody development, it's, I believe it was one of his last projects here in Palm Springs before he passed away. Um, it's my understanding that it was originally agreed to have a wall built completely uh, to surround the new development, which would protect everyone, the, the new residents of the new development, as well as the existing residents of the Palm Springs Country Club or the Whitewater Country Club condos. If they're allowed to construct only in a partial wall as phases are being built, it essentially eliminates that protection and the security of the existing gated community. Because you, if you look on the kind of far north and far west of that picture where the original country club gates were, if you open that up and then you open it up on the other side, the middle part of the, is no longer a gated community. And you've got a partial wall as the phases are being built, but it's not a comprehensive, secure environment anymore. So I just want to do go on record that I'd like to hear more about that from the developers when this does come up, and as well as clarification about whether it's 386 or Is staff prepared to respond? Yes, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind. Um, if you leave your contact information with uh, Ms. Hintz here, we'll have our staff planner who worked on the project get in touch with you, and he can talk to you about the approved plans in terms of the wall that has been approved. Uh, I'll just reassure you that there's no intent to <laughs> make gated communication communities insecure in terms of the wall that's around the, the right. gated community. Um, but again, if you leave your contact information, I'll have one of our planners get in touch with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time and thank you. consideration. I appreciate it. Now, uh, so we're moving on to new business. Item 4A, William Dumka on behalf of Michael King requesting a major architectural application for the construction of a 7,125 square foot storage facility located at 3520 North Anza Road. Staff report, please. Mr. Vice Chair, I would like to present to you Ms. Alex Perez, who is one of our new planners. You may have run into her at our holiday party over the weekend. Uh, but Welcome. since this is, this is the first case that she's presenting to you, I just wanted to introduce you to her. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Perez. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. The applicant, William Dumka, on behalf of the property owner, Michael King, has submitted a major architectural application for a 7,125 square foot industrial building located at 3520 North Anza Road. This parcel is located in the M1 service manufacturing zone. The proposed building is situated towards the rear of the property and will include a new landscape parking area with nine parking spaces and a new trash enclosure. The primary purpose of this building is to store classic vintage vehicles. As noted on the plan, there are no interior walls on, and the floor plan is open concept. Save for the restroom in the rear. The building will be constructed with conventional steel framing and painted insulated metal panels with a simulated stucco finish. The lar a large glazed window, gray metal roll-up door, and a yellow metal entry door with a metal overhang are located on the front elevation and will be visible from the public right-of-way. Air conditioning equipment will be placed at grade and will be concealed behind the proposed building. Roof parapets will hide any venting and piping, and no roof-mounted me mechanical equipment is proposed. This would be the front and the rear elevations, and the north and south, which would be enclosed behind, or I guess not visible from the public right away. This is a perspective of the proposed front elevation. 
Modular pavers will pave the parking lot and a four foot high concrete masonry block wall will be located on portions of the north, south, and west elevations um, on the property lines. That's not shown in this perspective. The project will include new landscaping throughout the parking lot. The proposed materials are appropriate for the surrounding area and offer to shade approximately 36% of the parking lot. The Palm Springs zoning code requires at least 30% of the parking lot be shaded. This project complies with that standard. This is an existing photograph of the site. Um, as you can see right now, it's being used as a unpermitted parking area. Um, these are the buildings on the north and the south the, of, of the proposed project site. The proposed project is consistent with the development standards in the M1 zone and has a similar and is similar in design and use as the surrounding buildings in that area. Staff recommends the planning commission approve the project based on the conditions of appro approval. Um, that concludes my presentation and the applicant is available to answer any questions. Commission's um, questions for staff, Mr. Donnefeld. I have a very non-substantive question. At the end of the staff report, there looks like there's a vote taken by former commissioners. Uh, what does that have to do with the we staff report? We discovered that a little bit late in terms of a typo. Oh, so okay. So that information does not belong there. I kept there. looking at it thinking, <laughs> gee, that was back in the day when J.R. Roberts was still on the commission, too. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Song? Welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, so if you look at the site plan, um, and if you're looking at the uh, southern property line, uh, there's a there's a proposed new wall, new site wall, and then there's nothing else um, for sixty percent of that property line. Is that because there's a building there? I think originally um, the, prop the proposed building was supposed to go to the property line because there is no side yard or side setback in that area. Um, it was conditioned by, I believe, the building and fire department to create a concrete walkway to allow um, another exit point from the rear to the front. Right. Um, so I'm. So is there is the new site wall continuing? for the entire property line? Right, I think um, maybe the applicant should answer that question. Okay. If, if, if a wall will be continued or if it's just proposed to stop there. Okay, thank you. Other questions of staff? All right, do we wanna hear from the applicant? All right, is the applicant here? Yes, please come forward. Hello, um, my name is William Dumka. I work for McGee Sharon Architects on behalf of Michael King. Um, in reference to the, the original question about the site walls, it, it is true, uh, originally we did design the building with the intent of infilling all the way to the property line, but as part of the fire department's uh, recommendations, they, they were looking for access all the way to the back door. Um, so we basically created that walkway all the way to the back. Um, the property walls, the intent of the property wall is just to provide some sort of context and give some privacy to the building itself, not so much as a feature of, of protecting the building or the property, that, not for security or anything else. Questions? Ms. Song? So uh, for that, um, for 95 feet, um, Somebody could just go to the um, property on the other side, and, and that's okay with you? Yes, there's no gate on the front entry as well. So. Oh, right, right, right. But um, so the wall stops, and then what's on the other side? Is it just gravel? Um, are you talking to the east of the? To the south. To the, to the south, there's a little bit of gravel. Um, it's basically right up, it's right up against, you see their uh, oh, see. tan, their, their wall there. Okay, so that wall that steps down, that's in the front yard, call it. Sure. It, you're gonna build another wall right next to it? Yes. 
to it, and it's the, the reason for that is to to create a new a, a new environment for the building itself, and also to provide backing to the trash enclosure, which will be up against that wall. So, uh, what what would be the space between that existing low wall and your proposed site wall? It, it would be a vacant area. I, I know, but what's that distance? The distance would be the remainder length of the building, which is, let me see here, which is roughly the, 95 feet to the back, to the back property I'm sorry, line. the width. I meant the width. Oh, the width? Yeah. Uh, it looks to scale about two, maybe a foot and a half to two feet from the property line to their building. All or to the building? To the building, to, from... From our property line to their building, it's about a two-foot gap. Okay, just one more time, sorry. I, that stepped low block wall, uh -huh. okay, does that line up with the parapet wall of the existing building, neighboring building? N no, I believe it's offset. It's actually on their property line. Is, our, which is the, also our, the shared property, the shared line, property line. Exactly. So if you build your wall, and right now the plan shows it on the property line, correct? you're essentially building a composite wall. You could say that, yes. We're building, but we're building it to our pre preferred height. Uh, okay. And, and that's your proposed design that mm -hmm. you build. So the footing will be an offset footing, <coughs> and it will just be gapped by a couple of inches? Yeah, for getting a toehold in there. So it would be like a two inch probably is what they need for a gap. And, and may I ask why wasn't, why is not this wall sort of in, in harmony with your wall design? Uh, oh, their, their wall in particular? I, I think it's just for a private, private owner issue so that we have control over our block wall and the, and the layout and design of it, as opposed to sharing that wall with the own next door neighbor. Okay, um, hmm. okay. Also, I should, should mention that the wall, the wall is, the intent was to have it continue around the front. And there was an idea for putting a gate, a rolling <coughs> gate in the front. So it would basically come out and hold the, the front on the, uh, west side of the building, it, property line from the street. Not proposing that right now. There's no gates. No gate. Yeah. There's, but so, there's a wall. But there's a wall. Correct. And the wall's the same height on the other side of the driveway as well, entry. Um. Yeah, so during engineering's review of the site plan, until you pointed it out just now, it, I did not pick up on the fact that there was that adjacent wall. And so the city engineer's policy on walls adjacent to each other is um, we typically don't allow those um, because it ends up being a maintenance issue or a property issue with this gap between walls and how do you maintain it? How do you keep trash out of it? How do you do something with it? So we, we try to discourage that from happening. And I, 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 um, I will admit I did, I did not pick up on that at the time that we were reviewing this. So it's not something that we would be inclined to, uh, to be in agreement with. You know. So, Mr. Vice Chair, what I might suggest is that engineering will have a condition of approval related to the design of the wall so that we uh, address that issue of a potential gap between the two walls. Ms. Hirschman, you have a question of the uh, applicant. I see your hand. <laughs> hmm. um, city engineer, I see your issue, and I'm proposing a solution because I do see that uh, it's going to be weird if he has this wall parallel with the street at a certain height and then it turns and it's low. That just seems quite bizarre to me and not at all attractive. So perhaps you could build your wall in the proposed location adjacent to the existing wall and create some sort of uh, sheet metal cap 
like a flashing detail almost between the two walls to eliminate the possibility that trash or other debris could accumulate in that crack is that would that be acceptable we have seen that in the past as long as that gap isn't too far well he's only saying an inch and a half yeah we, so that, i'm that saying can... a, a little sheet metal z clip or something that fits in that gap that's technical i'm sorry um <laughs> that would fit in that gap that would prohibit whatever you're concerned about from sure descending into that crack. he could you could he could send us a detail on that we'll work with him would it. that be acceptable? Sure. Thank you. Any other questions of both staff or the applicant? Uh, oh, Ms. Saw? I, I, I do have a comment. I, I think that uh, that is a solution, viable. I think that you need to talk to your neighbor and see what uh, is possible to work with their wall because once yeah. they touch their material, then it becomes a different uh, liability issue. Um, but in, in urban settings, your solution is perfect, but this is not an urban setting. Uh, in my perspective, it would be work with the wall, you know, work with their wall and your wall, and I'm sure you can come up with a nice transitional design. It, it might work that you can go to the, ten, th that wall's on the property line right now? Does it straddle the property line? Well, I'd, I'd like to verify it. But okay, so, yeah. so just assume it does for a minute. Uh, why don't you go to the... Land, a landlord, the owner, and say, I want to build a new wall. Can yeah. I tear this one down? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> but that's so I the mean, task of the engineer solving. with the, um, who's tasked? What we will do is staff will work with the applicant to resolve the issues with the wall on the southern boundary, which may either include a cap or the elimination of the existing wall in favor of the construction of a new wall. Uh, but again, staff will be tasked with working with the applicant in, in accomplishing that. My whole thing is that that area is one of the few areas now that is, there's infill available in Palm Springs. It's incredible how much we're building. So as the new projects come in, let's, let's make sure that it's clean and thoughtful. And, and even though it is an industrial area, it is still improved in a caring matter. Um, so that's my two cents, and I'm ready to make a motion. Any other discussion? Thank you very much, sir. Oh, sure. Thank Any you. other discussion? All right, then I would entertain a motion, please. I'm making a motion to accept the application with the condition of having staff work out the perimeter wall adjacency issues uh, with the neighboring existing wall. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Hirschbein. Any other discussion? Let's call the vote. Commissioner uh, oh, I'm Donovan. sorry, was there a com comment? No. Oh. Let's call the uh, question. Commissioner Donenfeld? Yes. Commissioner Hirschman? Yes. Commissioner Song? Yes. And Vice Chair Maruzzi? Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations to you. All right, where are we now? Planning Commission, oh no, discussion of general plan update and proposed steering committee. I think. <laughs> Flynn will probably have some uh, commentary on item 5A, general plan update. Actually, our project manager, Mr. David Newell, will uh, be giving that update for you. Very good. Mr. Chair and Planning Commissioners, uh, as discussed at your October 23rd meeting of this year, we are in the process of doing a limited general plan update, and we just wanted to provide you uh, a progress report on that um, today just to give you kind of an update and see, to see where we're at. Uh, right now we're in the data collection phase and we've been providing uh, the consultant placeworks with uh, all of the data necessary, including spatial data, GIS data, um, backup uh, reports, and other ordinances relevant for um, updating the city's general plan. Uh, the schedule is still uh, on track. We do anticipate it to ex take approximately 18 months. And we are in the process of forming the General Plan Steering Committee. Um, so in terms of the schedule, we anticipate holding regular monthly meetings 
with the uh, steering committee from January to July of next year. And we will also hold three community workshops in uh, right now tentatively scheduled for January, May, and January, May of next year and March of 2021. We included a copy of our, uh, tenant, our, our revised schedule uh, in your, attached to your memorandum that you received as a part of this uh, packet item. Um, and we also have tentatively scheduled the first kickoff meeting with our steering committee, January 13th. And that's uh, tentative at this point until we actually finalize all of the um, members of that committee. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank Would you. Would it be appropriate um, for, there's only going to be one planning commissioner assigned to this steering committee, correct? That is correct, yes. Would it be appropriate, now that we have some experienced commissioners here, to ask if anyone wants to be on it, or should we wait until... I, I'd like to wait until our next meeting. Um, one of the things I would like to do is to make sure that we have a full planning commission uh, before we decide to appoint a member of the planning commission to the steering committee, just to see who we have. Because, again, I have no idea who they're going to appoint at this will point in be, time. Will we have a full commission... I know they're interviewing soon, but will, will it be in time for council approval? They are scheduled to do the interviews on January the 7th. Our next planning commission meeting is on January the 8th. I don't think they're going to be able to make the appointments, but they will probably select them on the 7th. So... We won't have, uh, yeah. well, there'll be four of us on J January 8th. Yeah, we will probably only have the four of you on January the 8th, but we may know who the new planning commissioners are at but that can point. We, can, until they've been approved by council, they're not really seated. So can we, we can't jump the gun by selecting someone in advance of them no. actually being seated. It, it depends on what action they take on the 7th of January. Oh, you mean they'll meet us? They may meet in a public council meeting and, and approve, make the approvals at the. Uh, they engine. might. Yes. They've done that in the past. Yeah, I think. they okay. might do that. Explain that to me again, because they meet on Thursday. Yes, what the they typically do is they do the interviews, and at the conclusion of the interviews, they select the appointees, but they don't formally uh, appoint them until the city council meeting, the following city council meeting. But by the end of the meeting on the seventh, we may know who the appointees are. We've got, I, I think we understand that, but yeah. we still can't go forward on the 7th and, and make up that appointment because they won't have officially been seated. That's true, but again, we will assume that they will accept the appointment. Uh, the I, don't, I don't think we can do that because okay. we don't know. I mean, there may, obviously you're right, it's pretty perfunctory after that, but anything can happen. Uh, but I have seen them do, actually meet as a, in a, special council meeting the very day that they interview the applicants. And I think that, Jim, that can be done. And then they go ahead and take a vote. Yeah, and then, that, they, yeah. then they're that seated. That could be the case. And, and again, they haven't revealed how they're uh, going I, to I do mean, that. Because of this tremendous need here, this is an extraordinary situation we're facing. Uh, they should do that. <laughs> I, I would hope that they would. <laughs> would you Would you pass on our recommendation to them? <laughs> Certainly. It doesn't have to be agendized and given enough public notice yes. for this sort of thing? Yeah, they can do so that. So it would be put in advance, mm -hmm. it would be agendized. If they decide to do a public interview and appointment process right then and there, it would be agendized as such. Yeah. But, but back to David, uh, if their first meeting that they're scheduling for January 13th, if it could be moved to the second meeting, uh, I mean, towards the end of January, then we could have an official planning commission in which we could elect who that committee member would be. But I think Mr. Donovan has a point, which is we would have a full seven-member commission on at our meeting of January 8th if the council approved all of their appointments that same day in January 7th. If they don't, then we wait till January. Yeah, unfortunately, and what then is, that... What is pushes our, our schedule back, which is what I'm trying to avoid at all costs. So do you, do you see, there's sort of two things we're trying to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Trying to fill up the seats and get Keep the, the, someone chosen for the... Yeah, but it yeah. seems to me that if David is able to reschedule the meeting to later in January... But he just, they don't want to do that because they don't want to get off their schedule. <laughs> Never mind. Jim, am I being too picky in here about... Uh, Selecting someone before council has formally approved them for the office? Um, 
I mean, it really comes down to the risk of the person saying no or not being appointed or something like that, you know, moving a little bit ahead of the process. If you're certain that the person would accept it, would be able to serve, would actually be appointed, I mean, you could do it. Mm. Because the important thing is when that person is actually a committee member sitting down and actually doing the work, that they be an officially appointed member of the commission by that point. So again, it just becomes a practical issue of, are you jumping the gun a little bit because you may be selecting somebody that's not gonna be officially appointed or may not choose to do it or something like that. It just becomes a practical issue. There. Not a legal issue. I don't believe it's a legal issue. I think as long as they are sworn in and official by the time they're actually doing work of that committee, that's fine. Okay, well then I withdraw my concern. I, I listen to lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> so the council will hear two reasons why we wanna have them do this. One is we wanna complete the commission and secondly, we'd like to be able to choose uh, a member of the subcommittee or the, yes. All right, very good. Uh, any other? Let's see here. I guess that completes today's agenda. So are there um, any reports from members of the commission? Mr. Hirschbein. So um, <laughs> I know that a lot of effort goes into these meetings on staff's part, not just planning staff, but mm -hmm. the IT staff and the, <coughs> the food and beverage staff that brings us our water. A, a lot goes on. But... Unfortunately, today there were a lot of distractions. And at times during the meeting, it was really hard for me to focus on the specific agenda that we're here for because of some of those distractions. And obviously the IT part of it was some of it. And there was sometimes there was more than one meeting going on during the in the room, and that was distracting too. So I would just ask that in the future. Maybe IT can sort these issues out prior to our meetings, and if there's some business that needs to take place during the meeting that's not part of the agenda, that it, maybe we call a, a, a timeout and, and do that offline, but to do it concurrent with the staff report or, or public testimony, it's, it's, just, it's distracting and it's hard, hard to pay attention 100%. I will tell you, relative to the IT issues, we encountered the same issues at City Council last week. So you're not alone. And former Mayor Moon said, we've been dealing with this for three years. Maybe the solution is if there is an IT issue during the meeting, we just tell them to wait and we just do it like we did yeah, the old yeah, fashioned way. Because to have him crawling no, under my I desk agree. Agree. while there's a public, while the staff is trying to convey some important information that they've worked on, I mean, it's, it, it's disrespectful to them and it distracts us. It's just not appropriate. Before the meeting was able to inform me that my Tova, oh. My Tova. <laughs> my Tova uh, concerns are, are being addressed um, by the, the city. Well, uh, I can report. Our office did uh, speak with the city council on that, and uh, we have been directed to take all appropriate action to deal with Tova. So. What does that consist Well, we are looking at possible legal action. I can't go into any specifics about it, but I mean, it's just something that, you know, is on the table and we will do that if necessary. I'm so pleased. Obviously, they're taking it very seriously. It's yes, the previous are. council, but still. Yes, they are. I'm very pleased. And mm -hmm. I think this is probably in Dennis Woods district, I would assume. <laughs> yeah. So I think he'll probably be happy as well. He was, he was, was he? I didn't see him back there. Any other reports? Oh, I have a question for yes. Flynn. Now that Dennis is now serving on the council and the lease is a former commissioner, have they made the assignments yet to the liaisons to the commissions based it, on the new commission? No, they haven't done that yet. Because Dennis might want to be our new liaison. Yeah. Yeah. And Lisa might want him to. And Lisa might want him to. <laughs> Anything else? 
the planning director, do you have any comments? Uh, the only other thing I had to announce was the appointments to the planning commission. We've already discussed that as part of our general plan discussion, uh, so I don't have anything else. Uh, since we do have such a small planning commission at the moment, I really do appreciate your efforts to be here to review the materials. Uh, other than the few distractions that we had during the meeting, uh, again, I do appreciate your ability to get through the agenda and appreciate your service, so thank you all. Thank you, and uh, we will adjourn to the meeting of January 8th, is that correct? 2020. Happy, happy holidays. <laughs>